Hey Bio, this is a uh, video lecture on uh, regulating gene expression. And it's going to be, a, it's 12 slides, be kind of short one. So uh, go ahead and take out your uh, skeleton notes if you don't have them and let's get started. So just a quick reminder of what gene expression is. Remember, gene expression, right, expressing a gene is the process by which the information that a gene holds is used to create a product, right? So it's kind of like, uh, gene expression would be is the analogy the easy analogy of gene expression is um, the gene is the recipe and the protein is the product so like if you had a recipe in a cookbook and you used it to make a meal that's very similar to how a gene is used when a gene is expressed the gene is the instructions and it's used to make a protein just like a recipe in a cookbook could be used to make a meal um, so when genes are expressed, they're used to make the product. And there's a little diagram here you can kind of see. You have DNA. It's transcribed to make RNA. And that RNA is then translated to make an amino acid chain, which folds up into a functional protein that can be used for you know, a lot of different things. Whatever, whatever each protein has a different uh, function. Um, OK, so that was just a reminder. And remember this, just a, some heads up here. All of the cells in your body have the same genes, but not all of the cells make the same proteins. Every type of cell makes a certain set of proteins that they need for their specific function. So again, every single cell in your body has the same set of instructions or the same set of genes, but each cell might be different, right? So you have a cell that's a, in your eye. Let's say you have an eye cell and a brain cell and a skin cell. They all have the same genes, right? If you looked at the DNA in each of those cells, it'd be the same. However, they don't use the genes the same way. So some of the genes would just go completely unused in an eye cell that's being used in a brain cell, right? So keep that in mind, that the, the reason why cells can perform different functions is because they use the genes differently than other cells, even though they all have the same set of genes. And again, cells can change their gene expression, right? The proteins they produce. So a cell can respond to its environment or signals from other cells that tell it to use certain genes or to turn off certain genes. So this idea of gene expression um, is really, really important for cells because cells will make certain proteins from their genes, but they can be told either by other cells to change it up, to make more, to make less, or they can get signals from the outside environment, right? Like an injury or something coming in from the outside that tells the cell it needs to, to change what it's doing. So I wanna start off with um, transcription factors. That's the first way that genes are regulated. So <clears throat> there are a lot of different kinds of proteins that bind to what we call regulatory regions of DNA. So you've got your gene, right, which is a section of DNA. And then right before that gene, there's a regulatory region that will help determine whether this gene is turned on or off, right? So if you look at this image down here at the bottom, here is the gene, right, that section from this hash mark to this hash mark. But right before the gene, there is a regulatory sequence where something called a transcription factor can bind and either turn on or off this gene right here. So this gene, let's say, like imagine that there's a little switch. It's kind of like a light switch, right? You can turn the light on or off by switching it. This gene can be turned on or off by what the transcription factors right before the gene. So the, the, like the switch for the gene would be like right here. Um, and what they basically do is they these transcription factors um, can either upregulate, so increase the gene expression, or it can decrease the gene expression. So the gene can be making more proteins or less proteins based on what transcription factors are being used there. And the way that these transcription factors work is they come in, they bind to this area right before the gene, and they either, if they're going to upregulate it, meaning have the gene be used more, they will recruit the RNA polymerase to come to the gene and make the 
the RNA copy to begin the process of uh, gene expression. Or they might block RNA polymerase to downregulate the gene. So RNA polymerase will not be able to transcribe the gene, which means gene expression stops entirely. Another mechanism that they could do instead of just either recruiting or blocking RNA polymerase, they also could uh, loosen or tighten the DNA around the histone. So remember we were talking about chromosome structure, right? DNA is wrapped very tightly around these proteins. So what a transcription factor could do could just tighten that up so the gene is completely um, inaccessible and cannot be used. Or a transcription factor could bind and cause it to loosen. And now it's accessible and can be used to make a protein. So transcription factors will just kind of come in here to this little region and either turn on or turn off a gene by blocking or recruiting RNA polymerase or tightening or loosening a histone. But essentially, transcription factors can act as an on-off switch for a gene. So that's the first thing. The second one that I wanted to introduce is epigenetics. And epigenetics are um, changes in gene expression that are not caused by changes to the genome or to the sequence of the DNA. Um, so they're kind of similar to transcription factors in the, in the sense that they can turn a gene on and off just like a transcription uh, factor can. But the, there's a slight difference between them, and epigenetics is slightly different because instead of using these transcription factors, which are proteins, they use these chemical tags. Um, and in this diagram here, you see on the right side of the slide, we're looking at a gene, right? This little pinkish region here is the gene, right? Notice that it can either be easy to read, so it's really loose, or there's a gene over here that's hard to read, it's tight. So this is wrapped up really tightly, this is loose. So what you're seeing here is essentially epigenetics have turned off this gene, but have turned on this gene, and the reason why this gene is turned on is because the chemical tags, you see these little yellow or orange hexagons? These are the chemical tags. So when these chemical tags come in and bind to the histones, which are these blue proteins, it loosens it up and the gene is revealed and can be used to make a protein. But when the histones are not on there, notice there's no orange hexagons here, it's still wrapped up tightly and the gene is inaccessible and cannot be used to make a protein. So essentially epigenetics uses chemical tags to loosen or tighten the nucleosomes to either reveal or hide a gene. Um, so in that case, it's very similar to transcription factors. It can turn a gene on or off, just like a transcription factor can. However, the one really interesting difference here that um, is kind of fascinating is that epigenetics, these tags that you see here, see, like I was talking about earlier, these tags are environmental entirely. So like, it, they can change depending on your environment or on how you're experiencing your daily life. So if you're really stressed, you might have chemical tags on certain parts of your, your, your DNA that reveal genes that make proteins to help you deal with that stress, right? which could be a good thing. But if you're stressed all the time, let's say, like you're constantly stressed because you have like a, like, a, like, a, like a, just maybe it's family issues or it's a job that you don't like or it's, you know, whatever it might be, whatever stress might be in your life. If that stress stays around for a really long time, it's not a good thing to necessarily have all these stress proteins and stress hormones being released by your cells, right? And that could hurt you. So the idea is that these tags can be added or removed by lifestyle choices, right? So if you're able to sort of de-stress yourself, you can actually change the genes that are being used to express certain proteins, and that could make you more or less healthy. And the last piece that makes this more interesting uh, is that these tags are actually what we call our, we've, we just kind of figured this out in the last 10 years or so, is that they're heritable. Right? And when something is heritable, that means it can be passed on to future generations. So these, let's, let's, take a pic, let's use this as an example. Let's say this is a gene right here that is produced 
that is uh, expressed rather, that is loosened and available when someone has a lot of stress in their life, right? And it's producing this protein that increases your blood pressure to help you deal with the stress, right? And remember, high blood pressure isn't necessarily a good thing. It might be useful for a short period of time, but if you have high blood pressure for long periods of time, that can lead to things like heart attacks and strokes down the line. So if you're always stressed, right, because your job or your family or something like that, and you have this gene that's constantly expressed and producing that protein that increases your blood pressure or the hormone that increases your blood pressure, not only is that unhealthy for you, but guess what? Epigenetics, these chemical tags, they can actually appear on your gametes, so your sperm or egg, and you can pass that chemical tag onto your offspring, so that means that your child might be born with this uh, stress gene already turned on, which is not necessarily a good thing. So this kind of changes the way we might think about how we live our lives in a way, because if you, you know, if you're someone who's just going through your life saying, oh, I'm just going to make all the choices I want to make. It's not going to affect anyone else. I'm going to eat poorly. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to care about the stress levels in my life. I'm going to do maybe have a lot of bad habits that are causing these chemical tags to open up genes that you know, when expressed for long periods of time can make you unhealthy, you're not just hurting yourself, actually. You, so now we're realizing that you also have to think about if you want to have kids because you could pass that set of tags, that unhealthy set of tags that you've created in your life onto your child. So when you're, you know, thinking about your lifestyle and your behavior, it's possible that it can extend beyond yourself due to this idea of epigenetics, right? So you could pass that on to your offspring. So it's something to think about. It's a very interesting um, recent discovery where um, uh, whereas before we discovered this, we didn't really believe that what you did in your life could change, could impact your offspring too much, or at least genetically. So very interesting. If you want to know more about epigenetics, it's a very interesting topic. Um, come talk to me or you, know, you can do some research on your own, but it's very, very interesting. But let's move on to uh, a quick checkpoint. What I want you to do, actually, you know what? We're gonna, I'm gonna I put this up here for in class, but uh, you can do this on your own if you want, just to help you d d remember the differences between epigenetics and transcription factors. So maybe you know, think a little bit about how are, how is epigenetics and transcription factors similar, and how are they different? Something just to help you sort of process those two things. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about. Um, that's related to uh, gene expression and gene regulation is this idea of splicing. And this is actually a step that we left out when we were talking about protein synthesis. So with protein synthesis, you, you have your DNA, then you make mRNA, and then the mRNA is used to make a protein, right? Transcription and translation. What The step we left out, just that is actually kind of an important step, is before um, translation. So you have transcription, where DNA is used to make mRNA, right? But in between, you have a splicing step where the mRNA is spliced before it becomes the final mRNA that would be used in translation. And what that means is you have, essentially, you have this pre-mRNA molecule. And what we see is a picture of that right here. So this is pre-mRNA. And notice that it has blue and yellow segments to it. Well, it turns out that the blue segments are called introns, which is, these are two new terms that I would like you to know. Introns, which are pieces of DNA that are not going to be used in the final mRNA product. So they're going to be cut out. And then the yellow ones are the exons, which are the ones that will be used in the final mRNA, and they're gonna be spliced together to make the final mRNA that is then used in translation. So essentially you have your DNA and then in order to um, make the mRNA you have to cut out the introns and hook together the exons to make the mRNA which is then used for uh, pro uh, translation to make the final protein. Um, and so like I said before introns and exons are both transcribed into pre-mRNA and then they're cut out before translation. Um, and so that's a, this is a way of act, this, and so, you know, you might be thinking, well, how is that regulating gene expression? Because you're still expressing a gene, whether or not the introns and exons, that doesn't really seem to really matter too much. 
but it actually does because of something called alternative splicing. So you can imagine, right, here is um, a gene, right, this top one. You have a gene, the introns are green, and the exons are orange. So you've got one, two, three, four exons. That gene is transcribed, so you go through transcription to make pre-mRNA, right? And now you've got your exons left behind, one, two, three, four. So what can happen is, a, is you can now basically mix and match exons to create different proteins. So for example, I can make one mRNA that just has one, two, and three together, and that will give me one kind of protein, or I could do one, two, and four to make protein B. So essentially, I have one gene that can make two different proteins based on how I splice the exons together. So it, create, it, gives, us, um, it gives a cell the ability to make, um, 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 I guess, a higher variety of proteins for each gene, depending on how it splices it. So you can splice it this way or this way, and you get two different proteins after translation. So it's kind of cool. Um, and this, this is the reason why we only have about 30,000 genes. However, we make upwards of 100 or 120,000 different proteins. So if you do the math, like on average, each gene actually codes for three different proteins. So that would tell us that each gene could be spliced on average three different ways. So that changes which gene, or rather which protein is produced depending on how it's spliced. The way I like to think about it in terms of an analogy is splicing is kind of like editing a movie, right? Where when you edit a movie, you, sh you shoot you know, a, lot of, a lot of film, a lot of footage, and you have all this raw footage that you've shot. But that's not a movie, that's just raw footage. What you gotta do is you gotta sit down at the computer, open up your editing software, and go in and cut pieces of the movie out and stitch them together to make the movie you want. Just like with a gene, here's your raw footage, and you gotta sit down, and the cell has to edit out the pieces it doesn't want and hook together the pieces it does want to make the correct protein, right? And of course, you can, split, you can hook together different pieces to make different proteins. Just like with a movie, if you shoot like, you know, 10 hours of raw footage, and you give that raw footage to one editor, and you give the same raw footage to another editor, and you say, okay, you make me a movie with this raw footage, and you make me a movie with this raw footage, you're gonna, you could get back two potentially very different movies depending on how they edited the movie, like which pieces they decided to keep in, or which ones they cut out, how long they let, let a scene extend versus how short they made a scene. So you can get quite different movies from the same raw footage, just like with a gene, you can get different, quite different genes, or, quite di or sorry, quite different proteins from the same raw, DNA at the top, depending on how you edit it or splice it. So, just uh, some information here. Like I was, I kind of did this math already for you, um, but essentially, you've got um, the math show camp comes out to about fifty percent of the human genes undergo splicing. So half of all of our genes get spliced in alternative ways. The other half only have only go from a gene to one protein, and it turns out that on average it's about three different proteins per gene. However, there are some genes that can be spliced thousands of different ways to make thousands of different proteins, which is kind of crazy. But again, this is another way in which our cells can uh, take the genetic information and regulate how it's used to make different proteins by splicing it differently. All right, so that's the end of that. Uh, I'm going to ask you to finish up with a, your own brief summary of how alternative splicing can be used to create more than one protein from the same gene. So on your sheet, your last checkpoint there, I want you to write in your own words an explanation to answer this question. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. We'll be in class, go over a little bit. Uh, thanks for watching, and again, I'll see you guys in class.